Does anybody ever have reoccurring dreams? One that you have over and over? With dreams, some make perfect sense. Living out, living out a fear of yours is probably a common one. But others, sometimes you struggle to make sense of it. For instance, when I was in college, when I was college age, I kept having a dream that all my teeth were falling out, and I was trying to gather them up, and was somehow prevented from getting to the dentist to see what was going on, and then waking up in a sweat. And another one I started to have when I started preaching every week was it would be this time of the service. Music was done and then I would be called up to preach and I didn't have anything and I wasn't expecting to preach. Had nothing prepared, would go up and didn't know what to say because it, it caught me off guard and I, I kept having that dream probably a few times a month until it actually happened. That's one of those things that you don't think will ever happen. But it happened. And I'm glad it happened. Uh, we, we had a church retreat. Um, this was when I was serving as English pastor and a Chinese congregation in San Francisco. We did a big retreat every summer, and I had invited another pastor to be the speaker for the retreat weekend. Well, I got to do one of my favorite things to do is be the camp director for a few days. And Pastor Joseph was teaching through the four chapters of Philippians. And we had, we did a session Friday night, a session Saturday morning, that'd be chapter two, Saturday night, chapter three, and then Sunday, we we're going to do chapter four, and then go home as we were out camping, out at a camp facility. So, all had been going well, we gathered we gathered to worship before breaking camp and going home. I think there were 40 some mostly young people there. And just as the songs were wrapping up, it's where's Pastor Joseph? Pastor Joseph, are you here? I didn't see, I didn't see him anywhere. So I asked, does anybody know where Pastor Joseph went? And then one said, well, he left really early this morning. What do you mean he left? He's supposed to preach. He said, well, his wife, his wife's in the ER. He got a call and, and he had to leave. And so I'm like, I want to ask, okay, what are we going to do? But everybody's looking at me for what we're going to do. So I said, well, it's Philippians chapter four to finish off the series. Let's do it. So I got my Bible out and preached Philippians chapter four. And uh, when it was done, I knew the Holy Spirit was there. And I knew I did a pretty good job. And really getting called up to preach without any expectation that you were going to get called up to preach wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. And guess what? I stopped having that dream. And I've never had that dream again. And I had to share that because I'm in, it's Thanksgiving time, Sunday before Thanksgiving, and we're looking at 
part of Philippians chapter 4. Here, they say that uh, public speaking is a top fear of people. If you if you go up and you just really are nervous and you mess it all up, I mean, that tends to feel pretty humiliating. Top fear lists that people publish from surveys of what's your top fear, public speaking often comes in as number one. I heard a comedian say, public speaking's always number one. Surprisingly, death is number three. So if you go to a funeral, that means you'd rather be the one in the casket than the one giving the service. <laughs> That's, that, is, that is really funny when you put it that way. But Philippians chapter 4 deals a lot with our attitude. And we always talk about, we always talk about one aspect of our attitude come weekend before Thanksgiving, and that's thankfulness and how important it is. This, this chapter deals with a bit more than thankfulness, but thankfulness is really right there in the middle of it. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, Stand firm in the Lord this way, dear friends. So the opening of this chapter raises a few questions. Whenever you start with therefore, when you're reading the Bible, therefore what? So you have to turn back to the, and read the previous chapter whenever you see a therefore. And there are a lot of therefores in the Bible. So therefore what? Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Chapter 3 opens up, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it's we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh though I myself have reasons for such confidence. So he's writing about standing, rejoicing and standing firm in the midst of conflict that's going on in the Philippian church. He's writing about ones that came around stirring things up called Judaizers. And Judaizers were ones that were saying that you have to keep all of the Jewish laws and Jewish festivals before you can be a Christian. So they were saying that you, you had to be circumcised or you can't be a Christian. I mean, imagine going to a church and trying to push that. And I don't, I don't know how the sign-up sheet would be in the back. You had to talk about it's we who are the circumcision. And... Yeah, it's, it's strange to us in saying that you have to keep the kosher diet, keep all the Levitical laws, celebrate the Jewish festivals, and, you know, it, it was causing an uproar. He addresses that and is saying, stand firm. And then verse 2, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syncate to be of the same mind in the Lord. You have two ladies who weren't getting along. Two ladies that were having a quarrel or having a spat. But he tells them to be of the same mind in the Lord. As you read through letters in the New Testament, usually they're addressing problems and conflicts in the church, which is important to know is we certainly are not immune to them. He writes again and again, urging us to have unity, to be of the same minds, to put our needs and wants aside for the good of the whole. We go with the majority. There, you know, you hear of 
church splits and Baptist life over things like people can't agree on the color of the new carpet to pick out. And we can get very petty with our personal preferences. Verse 3, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, this is Paul the Apostle writing to the church in Philippi, yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. He knows these people. Piercy knows them well, and he's confident that they're going to be able to work things out. And then he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. I think a few things are important to know here. The context of it. He's writing about the church is having some problems. And then he goes on to tell them about how to have the right attitude. Now, some of his other letters, he knows the people involved here, and he gives advice for them to work it out. Some of his letters, they get on past that. Titus 3, verse 9 reminds Titus, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may, you may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. And he, different, different advice for different situations in the church. But here in Philippians, he brings them back to how, how are we going to have the right attitude? Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. It's, it's hard to rejoice. Hard to rejoice when things are not going right in our lives. Isn't it? But we see that again and again throughout the New Testament. Telling us to rejoice. Telling us to give thanks. Telling us to praise the Lord. Even when things feel like they're going wrong in our lives. Mm. Happiness, though, a lot, a lot of happiness just boils down to a choice. Are we going to be happy or are we going to be angry? You wake up and make that choice. They, I've heard it said, too, that with stress, there's really no such thing as it external stress that enters our lives. There are things that happen, and stress is caused by our reaction to the circumstances. Yes, there are things out there that are distressing, but stress is our response to stressors. And if there are external stressors, you don't have to have stress from them. You don't have to let them bother you. We do, though. It gets the best of us. Even, even when we work really hard for it not to. Then he says, he reminds us that the Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Gentleness being important, and he'd been writing about dealing with some conflicts. But he reminds us the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. How do you do that? Anybody here struggle with anxiety from time to time? I have. But here we see a command. Don't be anxious about anything. Easier said than done a lot of the time, but he tells us what to do with it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So, don't be anxious about anything. Again, 
stressors always going on in our lives. There's always something. But we can choose whether or not to be anxious about it because we could choose whether or not we're going to worry. It's, it's hard. Try to spend a day without worrying. It's, it's, not, it's not that easy. Sometimes our minds just wander off when we're not thinking about it. But uh, one, one trick I learned a long time ago, you say, I'm going to, I can't stop having these thoughts. I can't stop worrying. Try this. Just say, I'm going to worry about it for a minute. And look at your watch. And then I'm, and then I'm done. Jesus reminds us, who of you can add an hour to your life by worrying? Well, rhetorical question, but you can. Do not be anxious about anything, but then it tells us in every situation, by prayer, prayer is taking it to the Lord, and petition, petitioning Him, asking Him for something. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. So if you have something you're worrying about, something you're feeling anxious about, prayer. Prayer is a big help when we're feeling worried, when we're feeling anxious. We should pray sooner rather than later. Sometimes, you know, you're going to worry about it all day before you start praying about it. Well, start praying about it first. There are a lot of things that are out of our control that, we're, that we feel utterly powerless about. But we hand it to God. God's, God's on the throne. God's omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent as well, everywhere, all at once. It's saying, present your request to God. Remember, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. God wants our problems. He wants our anxieties. He wants our worries. So getting rid of our rejoicing, getting rid of our anxiousness, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Thanksgiving, there it is. That attitude that we're supposed to have, being grateful to God for all he's given to us as we sing this morning, count your blessings, name them one by one, Good practice, you start naming all the things you're thankful for throughout the day, then our problems don't seem to be so big. It seems like our problems are just a small percentage of all the blessings in our lives and all the things that are going right. But he says it in the context of prayer and anxiety. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When we feel thankful to things, are we just thankful for them, or do we thank God for them? God being the giver of every good gift. It's one thing to say, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for my family. Thankful to whom? Thankful to God. We ought to tell Him we're thankful. You think God wants to hear what we're thankful for? He does, or do you think he just wants to hear, Hey, Jeannie, fix this, fix that, grant my wishes. No. God, God wants to know that our heart's in the right place and that we're, we're thankful and we don't always just go to, go to God every time we want something and not for anything else. Heard a good question years ago. It was said of, if God was going to take away everything you haven't thanked him for, what, what would be left? Ooh, that's deep. That's personal. If, boy, if we're all going to be like losing a lot of things we haven't thought of. But with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Thanksgiving, how appropriate. It's Thanksgiving weekend here. Um, we remember the story of the pilgrims and that first Thanksgiving. Well, things weren't, things hadn't been 
going great for them the past year. They, they celebrated with that first Thanksgiving dinner, their one year anniversary of having arrived. They came from England to Massachusetts on a wooden ship. It took them 65 days at sea. Now, there are spiritual ancestors. They were ones that wanted to have a believer's church of people who voluntarily believed and wanted to be together and wanted to worship together. Not the state church that was run by the government that pretty much everybody was required to go to whether you're a believer or not. In England, they, they didn't want to be part of the Anglican church. They wanted a believer's church. And with that, they were persecuted for breaking away from the state church and founding a believer's church. Well, they, being persecuted, many of their leaders were arrested and put in jail. Well, they tried going off to the Netherlands. But, well, first Baptists were formed there of English people in the Netherlands. And some of them came back, some of them stayed, some of them came back, and the ones that came to came back, many from that congregation, that same group, got on the Mayflower. The ones that got on the Mayflower became the early Congregationalists. The ones that stayed in the Netherlands and came back and stayed in England were the First Baptists. Well, coming out of the same small group of churches. But they'd brought very little with them and the Mayflower was delayed in leaving, so they left late in the season, arriving now, this time of year. Go to Massachusetts this time of year, it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. And they had to build shelters. Arriving right before winter was a problem. And they brought with them seeds from England, that didn't do so well here. Either they faced a cold, hard first winter, many became sick, and by the end of the year, well, 102 of them came over. Anybody remember from history class? I think most of us learned this history if you grew up in California in fifth grade. How many were left? 102 came over. By the one-year anniversary, 44 of them survived. Um, not, not a great survival rate. But hey, the, native, the natives helped them, gave them some seeds, taught them how to farm here, helped them survive the first winter, and they were grateful. They were, hey, we're still alive. And they gathered for a celebratory feast right after that first year, giving thanks to God for seeing them through and that they were still alive. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is saying when we rejoice, when we choose not to be anxious by praying about it, by being thankful and presenting our request to God, then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, um, classic English version, the King James says that the peace which passeth all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So he's writing in the midst of conflict and more, maybe more astounding when he's talking about having the right attitude is he writes the Philippian letter from prison. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, 
think about such things. This list. He's saying, think the right thoughts. Think positive things. Don't dwell on negative thinking. Negative thinking's a big problem. Gives us a list. Things noble, what's noble? Right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Now just suppose you kept a you walked around with a notebook and wrote all your thoughts for the day. How many are gonna fall into this category? Maybe a few? Hmm? And then you could say the opposite. If a, th if a thought's not noble, don't think it. If it's not right, not pure, not admirable, not excellent, not praiseworthy, then don't think about those things. Great, great little booklet. Um, remember Norman Vincent Peale? He used to have the thought conditioners, just a bunch of Bible verses that you could read to get your head on straight. Get your attitude right for the day. Yeah. yeah, those are those are good. So he's encouraging us to rejoice. Rejoice always. Yeah, he's rejoicing being in prison for preaching the gospel. Do not be anxious about anything. You think that was easy to write? You think he's not a little bit anxious about what's going to happen to him? He's in prison awaiting trial not knowing if he's going to get out or if he's going to be executed as other Christian leaders had been. He's talking about Thanksgiving, and in the midst of this letter, you read the whole letter, he's very thankful for a lot of things, even though we would say he's not in an ideal situation. And then he's telling them, think the right thoughts, think admirable, lovely, noble, right, pure thoughts, then whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. There it is again, he said in verse 7, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. That's a nice picture. God's peace guarding my mind and my heart. And then in verse 9, and the peace of God will be with you. Who wants God's peace here? Yeah, all of us. And he's telling us how to get it. Verse 10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. At last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. You know, they, they sent Epaphroditus to him, a brother to go see if he needed anything in prison and to encourage him and to help take care of him if he needed it. And so he's saying thanks to them. And he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Anybody want to know the secret? He tells us, he tells us what it is in this next verse. I think it's hard to have a favorite verse in the Bible, but I think it's long been this. And Maybe it's been my favorite for a long time. It was, I know it was my favorite at least by the time I was a teenager, but I learned something. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly mean what I thought it means on the surface. King James and New King James says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And that's wonderful. That's very empowering. I can do anything with God's help. It means, and certainly the message of the Bible, all the great stories and heroes of the faith, has God time after time asking people to do hard things, sometimes things that see, seem impossible. 
But what is impossible with God? Nothing. So with God's help and God's leading, we really can do anything. But taking it in context, it means something a little different. It says, verse, verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. NIV says all this, which then you have to ask this, all what? And it's tied, it's tied to this paragraph of him saying, I've learned how to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I know the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So he's saying, hey, there's been good times. We could all say this in our lives. There's been good times and there's been hard times. There's been times where we've had plenty and there's been times where things have been really tight. But I've learned to be content in any and every situation. That's pretty much everything. And remember, as he's sitting there writing this, what's his situation? Being in prison for preaching the gospel, awaiting trial, not knowing if he's going to be punished, executed, or set free. Yet, he's content. Some of the time, Paul's had a few imprisonments, so um, some of them he's had a little more freedom than others to see visitors. Some of them he's writes that he's been chained to a guard. I mean, going to prison or jail prison, it's bad enough. But if you got to be chained to the officer, that's just really got to make it that much worse. And I don't know, some of these ancient prisons are a worse situation than what you might think of now. I mean, now they call it three hots and a cot. A three hot meals and a cot to sleep on. I mean, we don't know what he was getting. Maybe one cold meal and the floor to sleep on. I mean, yeah. yet he's writing about having a good attitude. In spite of that, he's learning about being content. Well, so much of our life comes down to attitude. Having the right attitude, the circumstances the circumstances aren't as important as how you respond to it. Kind of like playing the hand you're dealt. The Bible tells us over and over that life is going to be hard. But having the right attitude is the key that gets you through it. I can do all this. How? Through him who gives me strength. I can have a good attitude all the time in any situation and in every situation through him who gives me strength. Who is him who gives me strength? Well, Jesus. He's saying, he's saying you have anxiety in verse 6. Don't be anxious, but by prayer, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, that means it doesn't make sense. The peace, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Then he tells us about what kind of thoughts to think and what kind of thoughts not to think. And then how to be content. How do we be content? By being thankful by giving it to God, by having the right thoughts, by fixing our attitudes. And you know what? I know this, and sometimes it still just gets the better of me. Sometimes I still find myself having a poor attitude some days. And that's, that's unfortunate, but you know what you do? You go back to this. You go back to this, and I'm thinking like, okay, having a bad day. But you know what? I need to fix my attitude. And the Bible tells me how to do it. So one of those things, I go back to this chapter 
over and over and over and over. Can't get enough of it. Um, still, still my favorite verse, still one of my favorites, but very appropriate for Thanksgiving weekend. Think about this. Think about this when you gather for Thanksgiving and you think about what you're thankful for. Happiness, the choice is yours. Now, we're going to we're going to have a last song and as we close, if you'd like to come forward for prayer to meet Jesus, to get back on track with the Lord or anything else you'd like prayed for, I'd be happy to pray for you one on one as we close.